Hello world, I'm your host, Data Mining Mike, and on this episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about how long does it take to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. Today's guest is my sister, Sarah Cutright. She hiked the PCT from the Mexican border to Canada in one shot. She has incredible stories of her breathtaking adventures through the wilds of America. She is a library of knowledge with backpacking tips and survivability hacks. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction, you will be able to take what you've learned and apply it to your backpacking knowledge. And that's called value, and because of that, you should like this video. Remember that sharing is caring. Please leave comments because they improve ranking and add prominence. Subscribing is what winners do, but smashing the bell is what legends do. This channel breeds legends. But first, AI news. Elon Musk's newest company, XAI, has created a large language chatbot model to rival ChatGPT. The model is named Grok. Grok doesn't beat GPT-4 in evaluation scores, however, comma, pause for effect, Grok is supposed to respond more moderately on political issues and have a sassy personality to nefarious questions. Hello, everybody and listeners. Um, thank you, Mike, so much for having me on today. Um, it took me almost six months to hike the PCT. I'd say on average, it takes anywhere between four to six months. What time of year did you start? I started in the middle of April. I started April 16th, 2016. And I went all the way until October 8th of 2016. What made you want to do the PCT? So what made me want to do the PCT was, to me, it was something that had just always called to me as a person. Ever since I first heard about the PCT when I was about... 11 years old I went backpacking with my uncle Scott and my cousins and uh, one of my uncle Scott's friends we went backpacking up to Heather and Glasses Lake in um, just northwest of Lake Wenatchee in Washington and when you get up to Hidden or Glasses Lake from Heather Lake that's where it is, Heather Lake. Did I say Hidden or Heather Lake? Either way, when you go up to that little lake that's there, the PCT runs pretty, it runs right next to it. And we had done this hike in the summertime. And there was some through hikers that were walking on that trail at that time. And we ended up meeting one of those through hikers that day. And... My Uncle Scott was like, yeah, this trail goes all the way from Argentina to Alaska. And he was like, these people are hiking all the way to Argent to Alaska. And I just remember thinking, holy heck, that is insane. Like, who the hell is going to walk that far? I'm like, that is a trip of a walk to in journey and a madman to want to walk that far. All the way from the most southernest point in the north of like almost in the world to the one of the most northernest points in the world just blew my mind and so well I mean later down the road you know I always thought that's what the PCT was and just thought that was kind of cool and then later I ended up moving to Wenatchee um when I was 16 almost 17 and didn't really have much of a like a social life and stuff so I ended up turning to the outdoors ended up buying a guided book that ended up having over like 200 day hikes I believe it's called Central Washington day hikes um hiking book something like that or Central Washington Cascades hiking book day book and I ended up getting hooked to that book it was like kind of a like a Bible for me in a sense, just always just really reading into it, doing all the day hikes, 
trying to eventually it turned into a goal where I wanted to complete that entire book, which later in life I ended up completing that book, did every day hike on that book. Hallelujah. And one of them was up to go do a day hike up to Hope in Mig Lake, which is just on just a little bit past Stevens Pass, basically on Stevens Pass. And when I was up there, I had to have been about 19 years old at the time. And I ended up seeing the sign, the PCT Trail 2000. And there was a sign that said one way to Mexico and the other way to Canada. And it said the miles. It was like, it was like 300 miles to Canada, 2,200 some odd miles to Canada. Mexico and I just remember standing on that and I just had this overwhelming flashback as being a kid you know being at Glasses Lake with my uncle Scott and telling me about this trail going from Argentina to Alaska and being like oh my gosh like this this is it this is that trail and I just instantly just had this like this like fate based feeling, this intuitional feeling that just kind of came to me. It was like a spark. It was like a miracle that happened inside my mind that was just like, you need to go and like investigate this. And so that evening I, when I drove home, I got on my phone and I just looked up what the Pacific Crest Trail was. And I just read all about it and I was like, oh my gosh, like here I am. I've been doing all this hiking and stuff. Like I would love to go on this backpacking journey across the United States. And then also to find out it it really doesn't go from Argentina to Alaska. It just goes from Mexico to Canada. Just let you know. Um, And I was like, wow, like I could do this. This is amazing. Uh, I was like, and then... I ended up like looking more into it and just seeing that all the stars were starting to align and the confidence in myself to feel more determined to want to do this just really started to go up for me. And then it was in the late summer of 2015, I was going um, to go do a day hike over in just by Yakima went to like some caves that are over there and I wanted to go and go up to Chinook Pass I've never driven on Chinook Pass ever which is in Washington and when I got up there it's beautiful driving Chinook Pass I don't know if you've ever done it it's highly recommend it it is such a beautiful when you get up to the top going westbound from like Yakima over to like the west side you immediately go over this beautiful arch that says welcome to Mount Rainier National Park and it's just boom Mount Rainier right in your face just glorious hell and it was such a beautiful day and you can immediately pull off too, like right at the summit so I pulled off and there was a trail there and I was like you know I'm gonna walk on this trail And it just, everything was just so beautiful, magical feeling. And when I got to, I went on this little overpass arch bridge where the sign is when you're going over the highway. And then there was the PCT symbol and I was on the Pacific Crest Trail again. And I just immediately had this like big burst of just cold air hit me. And it was just this feeling of home of like, this is where you need to be. This, this is mountains calling you to come. Like you need to do this. And I just knew right then and there, I was like, this is it. I'm doing it. I'm going to do whatever I can take from this point on. And I'm going to plan on hiking this trail as soon as I possibly could. And I had already like gathered all my gear and everything to hike the PCT or not to pike the PCC. I just already had backpacking gear because I was already into backpacking and day hiking. So I had a lot of gear as it was. It was just more or less in the next few months from that point on. I'd say like 10 months I needed to start saving as much money as I possibly could to prepare myself for this adventure. And so that is pretty much how I 
what made me want to do the PCT was, you know, just this grand adventure of, of things leading up and just this intuitional calling of saying like, you need to go do this. Um, this is what the path you, you need to go down in life. And it was just something I really wanted to do. And it was something I felt like that needed to happen for me as, as a human being, as a soul on earth. It was just something that was going to carve who I am today. And I'm glad that I did. Cool. So what was your first question when you were doing it? I'm sure you thought, how long is this going to take? How long do you think you were going to take? Oh man. My first question to myself yeah, it was, it was definitely like safety. (laughs) That's what I was like really questioning myself. I was like really scared for my safety. Like I have never traveled by myself in the sense of like, you know, like I would travel, I'd be gone for a couple of days, but I'd come home, you know, or I'd be with somebody. Like I was doing something all by myself. Like that was my biggest concern was just safety. Like, am I going to be okay? Are there going to be any weirdos out here on the trail? Am I going to get sex trafficked, sex trafficked or something like that? Cause I'm right on the Mexican border down South. Like I have to do hitchhiking. Am I going to get stolen while I'm hitchhiking? What happens if I get bit by a rattlesnake? What if, you know, I fall to my death or drown going over some mountain pass creeks, streams or rivers or whatever. That's, that was the first thing that came across my mind. That was one of my first questions. The second question I would say too was, um, like, uh, I would say like how alone and how, like, how remote is this? That was another one. And also like how well traffic not traffic, but, um, like how, how good is the trail? Like how reliable is it? Am I going to be getting lost a lot? Is there a lot of sections of the trail where it's just not clear? Is it pretty well maintained? Like stuff like that. Those were part of it as well, but safety for sure. That was my biggest concern when I was going to go do the trail. So how safe is the trail? It's pretty safe. It's a really safe trail. I, I think for me, I had built up this mental, um, anxiety, you know, I played this huge thing in my head that it was just going to be this scary, unsafe experience. And it is, it was not that at all. It was actually extremely safe. It is everybody on that trail is looking out for your best intentions, period. I never met a single person who didn't look out for my intentions ever. It is literally like a family, one of the biggest, most closest, comfortable family that you could ever be in front of. And it's just nothing but just true love. Like it was just an ex- an extraordinary experience and like animals and stuff like that. It's really crazy. You get into this like cool, um, you get into this really cool like becoming one with nature you find yourself that you actually you end up seeing yourself as one with nature and in reality that's the thing that I took from the trail is that I still am one with nature but really being part of it you just become it like the animals and stuff like that start to see you as one with nature when you're out there and you start to see yourself as one with them too And so it's like, you could walk by, like I've walked by so many rattlesnakes. I've seen bears. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Nothing like crazy. I mean, I saw a few, like three bears and so many rattlesnakes and snakes and lizards, spiders, all sorts of bugs. Um, And it just got to the point where it just didn't scare me anymore. Like none of it scared me. And I got over that fear really quick. I remember like the first week or not the first, it was like the almost a week. Every day I woke up with a tick on me. Yeah. 
gross. I saw a tick on me every morning for like a week. It was in my hair, all climb, crawling around on me. And I was always freaked out until, and I'd kill the tick. And then the last time that I had a tick on me, I didn't kill the tick. I ended up letting the tick go and I never had a tick on me ever since then. And it was kind of like this mutual respect of, I felt like looking back where it was me allowing myself to be one with nature and that we're sharing this environment together and that this is their home too. And I shouldn't just like be this murderous person. I mean, granted I, I kill ticks now, <laughs> especially if they're in my own home, but it was just like being out there. I was in a totally different element than being here in a confined city versus being out in nature and just living in a living out of my backpack. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, let's start off El Campo, <clears throat> El Campo, California. That's where you started off. Cause yeah. I remember that I remember dropping you off and there was the border wall there, which was a joke, total joke. Oh, I like, know. It's just corrugated, ru- rusted, corrugated, <laughs> Uh, shingle roofing on metal fence and if you want to jump it there's nothing stopping you but either way we started off there you started off there you touched the fence the border wall Mm -hmm. and then you took off down the trail well of course you got the photos at the the trailhead start with the three poles yeah and then you took off. So from that point, what were you thinking once you realized you were on your own? Oh, man. That whole day, that was so fun. That was a really cool. I'm oh, like, yeah. so, I'm like so glad that you got to be there and oh, experience yeah. Yeah, that. I was definitely. like so blessed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was scared shitless that day. <laughs> I was terrified. I was, oh my gosh, I was so scared that day. I think that was like one of the most scariest days of my life, to tell you the truth. Yeah, it was uncanny. Yeah. It didn't, it was like, oh shit, there you go. You might die. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I know, like. thought it. I think everybody was overwhelmed with the monsters that could be. Yeah, it really was. Like, every, everybody was scared. I was scared of shit. And it turned out being like, oh, my God, I freaking love that day. Like, looking back on it, I was so terrified. I remember even driving, leaving your house. A part of me was like that that comfort side of myself was like, don't leave their house. You need to stay here in San Diego. Like, you should maybe wait a couple more days. Like, you shouldn't get on this trail. Maybe you should day hike it or something and then come back and then go back out again or something like that. Um, but yeah, I was so scared. I just remember getting to the trailhead and you guys did the first mile with me. And then that's when we said our goodbyes. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was going to see you guys again because I mean, the trail, the highway system, like right there. Um, what was that town? Oh, one of the towns like Julian, Mm -hmm. you guys live, you guys lived right near julian Julian. yeah so on warner springs that's where it was Mm -hmm. you guys were like 30 minutes from warner springs Mm -hmm. so i knew when i got there that i would probably like go in and go spend like a night or something like that versus staying like in a hotel or somewhere like that it would be easier for you guys to trail angel Mm -hmm. me that day and my first day it went really good i was really nervous it was a really nice day Um, I think it took me about like three hours until I came across my first PCT hiker that I came across and she, I don't even remember his name. I don't, I remember what he looked like. Totally don't remember his name and ending up like meeting a few other people, met some woman from like Switzerland that day met some people from California people from Texas from all over the United States and it was really cool because then when it came to trying to find camp that night I ended up finding a giant campground or campsite that fit like like shoot like 30 people 
and we all it was there was literally like 20 people in this campsite and we all managed to like makeshift together and it was just really beautiful because we all ate dinner together and we all talked to each other and we were all scared together mm, interesting yeah okay. we were all scared together because and we were all by ourselves nobody was coming so like you're all day oneers yeah you know, we were all day oneers and more than half of us have never through hiked anything ever in our lives like some of us were had already done like the Appalachian Trail already or some other long distance trail like the Colorado Trail and but still almost all of us were all scared and we all had this beautiful just like comfort towards each other because when we were all ate dinner together that night figuring somewhat like shoot there was somebody there that didn't even know how to use their stove because it was the first time ever using a stove like a little pocket rocket or their jet boil or something cooking some mountain house meal they've never had because this is their first time ever actually honestly even camping period or even backpacking and I just remember us being all just scared and it just brought us all you could just feel the the anxiety come down that evening because we all had each other and every single one of us were experiencing the exact same feeling and we were all there to comfort one another and none of us were going to let anything bad happen to each other that night like if some animal were to come into our campground like a mountain lion or coyote or something like we were going to be there to fight together like nothing like we could go to each other it was just this instantaneous connection and so it was it was very good like I'm really glad that my first day ended on that beautiful note of just knowing that there was people there that I wasn't alone and then my second day waking up I purposely woke up really early that day because I wanted to experience my first sunrise on this trail. Mm -hmm. I was like, I remember that being like one of my first mental notes. I was like, I got to experience that first sunrise. And I remember climbing up on a, this huge giant boulder and I just sat there and I just, I, I just prayed and meditated and just really hung in and just was talking to God, listen, watching the sun come up just taking in and I was uh, of what this trail is going to be for the next six months like five to six months like what is what is this going to be for me and just surrendering myself at that point and just being like you know what I'm I'm going to put my faith into your hands you you showed me good yesterday I know it's going to be good from here on out and dude, that second day kicked my ass. <laughs> like, holy <Yeah>. cow. <laughs> it really tested you then. Yeah, it was. It was a test because, man, that first 20 miles from the border to Lake Morena. Okay, so you answered that quite 20 miles. What you first, you went. Oh, yeah. The yeah. first 20 miles, dude. That is a freaking trek, dude. It You go up this, I don't even know what the mountain is. I think it's Mount Morena. And that trek up that hill was no joke. And kid you not, when you're first time through hiker, and I honestly didn't do much research in the beginning. I think I maybe like looked up. I mean, I was so used to like doing overnight backpacking. So I kind of assumed that's what I needed to bring on a through hike. Mm -hmm. You know, I just got the basic shit that I needed and I had a lot of heavy weight and a lot of crap that I really didn't need that I thought I needed. And so that first 20 miles going up this brutal, like I went through this canyon ravine and then up this backside of this mountain. And then when you get up to the top, you get to see Lake Morena. And I just remember getting down there and getting to Lake Morena um yeah that was it was a brutal 20 miles it was it was hard and it was hot too I think it was like got up to like 85 I didn't know anything about like siesting anything like you're in the desert it just sucked there wasn't much water I had so much water too like I overpacked with water 
because I didn't know what I was expecting. <laughs> I just know it's desolate desert. I'm like, bring nine, bring nine liters of water. And yeah, it was, it was rough that second day, but I made it through and it was so fun because I met so much more cool people that day. And I met, yeah, I met like a couple of gals that day and they were so, they were really cool. Like I ended up eating lunch with them in Lake Morena. And we are in, I just remember getting there and all of us were like talking about that 20 mile stretch, how brutal it was. Like we didn't even expect it coming. And we were like, man, I hope the rest of the PCT isn't like that. And it, it isn't, it's not like that. That first 20 miles is just, it's just like that. It's all the rest of it from that for the next few hundred miles wasn't as bad compared to that first. That first was definitely an introduction. That is for sure not gonna be easy yeah it wasn't but then after that like going from lake marina to mount laguna which mount laguna i think is at 40 miles on the pct which was nothing hard and mount laguna is really pretty it's like high alpine desert so there's like uh like du not douglas firs there were some kind of fir tree they had huge pine cones one of the biggest pine cones i've ever seen up there and it was, it was really cool. That was a really cool. The first best view is in Mount Laguna, like real view. And you get to look into the Anza Borrego desert below. Beautiful desert too. Um, but yeah, that was the first real beautiful view on that trail is Mount Laguna. That's awesome. Yeah. I could go back to that view. I still, to this day, it's still all, it, it, took my breath away seeing i was like whoa i was like this is what this trek's about <laughs> That's cool. yeah just like being on top of this mountain and then just seeing down into the anza Borrego desert you're just like whoa and it's desolate out there i mean i'm pretty sure you living down in southern california you've probably been out to the anza Borrego a few times uh, maybe i, I mean so i bet you like trained a lot out there i bet the they got Mojave. Yeah. Just in 29 Palms. Yeah. In Anza Borrego's in, it's in San Diego County. It's just, it's like, you know, when you go to Julian and mm -hmm. you, you just keep going east from Julian about like 10 miles. Mm -hmm. Then you're in the Anza Borrego. Maybe a little more than that. Maybe 20 miles. Then you're in the Anza Borrego Desert. It's desolate as hell out there. It's just really beautiful. There's like nice mountains, no trees. Not a single one lives on there. It's just brown but we're really like a really pretty brown like desolate tr like treeless mountains that's cool yeah so after mount laguna then what um yeah then after mount laguna met some more people i tried my first rattlesnake I had rattlesnake for the first time out there. That was really cool. Okay. Yeah, that was like a really special moment. Ended up meeting another PCT hiker. His name was Rattlesnake. Since he, that's what he got named for because he ended up killing a rattlesnake. Mm. And we all ended up staying in this giant campsite spot. It was kind of makeshift. It was more like a parking lot off of like an old dirt road. Mm -hmm. And it was like... 30 hikers and this guy ended up making this rattlesnake in his jet boil with like teriyaki sauce and it was really cool like we all ended up like every single one of us all tried rattlesnake together for the taste? first time it tastes amazing it was really good it was like chicken, like chicken. it was like a squishy um kind of remind me of like shrimp that mm -hmm. shrimp texture lobster mm -hmm. shrimp that squishiness mm-hmm but very like flavorful, like a, like chicken. And it's like a white meat too. So it was really good. Yeah, yeah. So you, it seems you got a really good education on botany and all the plants. So yeah. Yeah. Talk about that as you progress. Yeah, I did. I learned a lot about, a lot about plants I remember even too, it was like my second hitchhike. It was actually my first hitchhike ever by myself. Cause all of, before this, I had been hitchhiking with 
other through hikers. Like I wasn't doing it by myself, but my first one that I did by myself, it was at Cajon Pass. And I had met this guy and he was a botanist. He was like some botanist guy who lived in like LA, was driving out through like the 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 Los Angeles mountains. And he was like telling me all about it. We like pulled off on the side of the road and he was like showing me everything. He was like, see all these plants here? You can eat these. And like showing me how I can eat them and like what the medicinal aspect of it was. And I was like writing it down in my journal, like trying to, and like taking pictures on my phone. And like, cause you can take a picture and you can screenshot it and you can write. And I was doing that on some of them. I ended up like deleting them later cause I was like learned them. Um, and you just get to know a lot about the plants very quickly. There's also a, like you'll on the trail, there's a lot of like, um, cause the PCT is, there's a lot of also day hikes that go up to the PCT. So you'll see also a lot of like signs of like next to the tree or plant. And it's like, this is a Yakima tree, or this is a, a Wally tree, or this is a Douglas fir, or this is a ponderosa pine. Here's like a certain a barrel cactus or something like that you'll come across. One that was pretty crazy plant wise was this plant it was just called a poodle dog bush plant. Crazy as hell. Um, it's like poison ivy, but it's like on crack. It's it's pretty intense from what I've heard. I went through a whole bunch of it. I didn't get anything, but I also have been through like tons of poison ivy and poison oak patches and I don't really get bad reactions to it. Just, that's just how I am. I know like I've been around a lot of people who have had other kind of other encounters where it didn't like for instance, like this poodle dog bush, there was a dog that was on the trail and she went, she was, this dog, it was a girl dog. She was trekking through it and it ended up getting in her eye and the poor dog by the end of the hike freaking had to get both of her eyes taken out. She literally lost two of her eyes. Famous dog. Her name is Katana. Um, she's through hiked all three piece, all three um, major trail systems in the United States she did the AT, the CDT, and the PCT. Amazing dog, really amazing. I think there's even probably a book about her somewhere. Um, and yeah, this dog, like literally, I believe that's exactly what happened. I mean, don't quote me wrong, but I remember the the mayor, that's his name, was telling me that it had got in her eye and just completely wrecked her. And then there was a few other through hikers that got it. A lot of people were getting off trail during that time too, because they were going through it. And then just the mentalness of the PCT, I guess it's a pretty common spot. Um, um, where that the pool dog push, which is predominantly in the Los Angeles mountains. I would say that's where i remember seeing it the most so which is about mile like 300 to like 500 in that stretch that's where a lot of the a lot of this bush is so if you want to kill dogs get a poodle dog <laughs> yeah pretty much you don't want to miss them they're, they're really pretty too they're a pretty looking bush they're like purple have these purple little flowers and i believe that's when they are the worst is when they're in bloom yeah and yeah they're they're just like poison oak and stuff like that and if you're pulling on it it ain't good you're like you'll get it there was even a through hiker where i met and his name became poodle dog bush because he ended up getting poodle dog bush all over his body and had to go to the hospital <laughs> and like completely broke out with a bad reaction and so that's how he ended up getting his trail name damn yeah that sucks yeah it did suck i the i think name, it's pretty oh man yeah there's a lot the trail names dude they're they're funny 
Yeah, talk about the trail naming. Yeah, so trail naming is part of the part of like the collective. It's part of what you do on the trail. It's it's part of the um it, the com- it's a name a trail name is a person is a name that you call a pseudo name that you give to other people. Yeah, it everybody is. Everybody knows who it is. Yep. And yeah, on the on the PCT, once you get a trail name, you never go by your real name. You honestly forget your real identity and you become this new identity of a person. It's like an altered ego you basically become. And that is part of the trail is getting your trail name and you embracing this new person. And so my trail name ended up becoming Blossom. That's who I am. I'm your girl, Blossom. Um, I ended up getting my trail name because I was making a whole bunch of wild flower bouquets and leaving them around. And it was just really crazy because the more that I had embodied this person, the more my trail name started to make sense and it really fit who I really was. Um, like for instance, I wore this big sun hat and the bill was always flipped up and people, when I told them my trail name was Blossom, they were like, Oh, like the TV show from the nineties, you know what I'm talking about? Like the girl from the big bang theory, um, Sheldon's girlfriend, I can't think of her name, but she, she was the star of that TV show Blossom and everyone's like, Oh it's you're like her that's where you got and I was like no I got it from this and it just started to escalate like I just really took that name and just made a meaning for myself with it and that is what every single person did and I noticed that the people who stayed on the trail the longest were the people who really embraced that with confidence and full potential of like putting that trail name into who they are. And it was really cool because it's like it connected a part of my soul to myself that I didn't even know existed. And uh, and I still like Blossom still lives out on those trails. Any trail I go on to like Blossom will bloom into being that being being me again. Um and yeah, and just like the things that led up to it. So let me reframe here. So it was just the, the flowers, the sun hat. I found myself, I wore blue the whole time. Everything, I, like my whole outfit that I had picked out, I didn't realize it until like about a thousand miles in. I was like, holy shit, I'm wearing all blue. Like my shorts were blue. My, hi, my hiking top was blue. My backpack was blue. My shoes were even blue. And I just started to become, okay, I'm like, all right, I'm your girl Blossom. I'm a blue Blossom. And I was like, okay, well, what what Blossom am I? And then on 4th of July, me and a group of hikers, we ended up doing this Yosemite detour, which was, we did the PCT, but we did a different kind of version, like an alternate route. And we wanted to kind of have a way to mark each other to know who's in front of everywhere. And when we were in Yosemite Valley for 4th of July, we ended up finding all this chalk and we were like, all right, everybody assigns their own color. And so I took the blue chalk and everybody took their own and everybody did their own symbols. And I did a flower. That was my symbol. And find out my symbol flower later on in the trail was the exact same symbol as a forget me not flower didn't even know it till later but that is the exact flower that I always was drawing and forget me nots are blue flowers and those are symbols that you as a symbol of like that you give to people when you're leaving it's like a form of passage and so that is what I found it was like that was my symbol of who Blossom is. I was Blossom, the blue forget-me-not, yo girl. <laughs> and 
yeah, just really cool. And I met so many other through hikers and they all just really embraced their names and I loved the trail name system and it was really weird too whenever you would like disclose who your real name was like for instance I was hiking with this guy like he was in my group bubble I should say we weren't really hiking together but he was in my group bubble and I had been hiking in my group bubble shoot probably since the beginning I'd say we had been hiking along each other camping periodically together at nights for about a th- almost a thousand miles and then he finally disclosed his name to me and it was weird I was like what <laughs> and we were like holy cow and then that was it never called him by his real name just kept it as the trail name was it gross to hear no your real name or something? no it wasn't it's just it's really weird when somebody would tell you their real name they're breaking character yeah it is it's like you're breaking character it's like going against like a code of conduct and the crazy thing is is it's like you don't tell people like if you're not close with that person on the trail you do definitely like you just don't tell them your real name unless you're like obviously in like uh, you know public setting type thing and you have to like you're at the post office or something like that. But even when you go and get mail and you're like picking up your mail, it says your trail name on it. It doesn't even like that's how it was for me when like I'd get packages sent to me by people. They weren't even putting Sarah on it. They were putting Blossom on my as my name on my my uh, packages and stuff. And same with other hikers. It just completely deviated that way. But I met some really cool trail names of people, like, so many. There were so many cool names out there. Like, funny ones. Like, there's, like, two meals. There's, um, a wing it. There's, like, people go by Barbie. There's people who go by Smelly Socks. There's somebody who goes by pumpkin somebody who goes by um oh my gosh what is it like the um, like the sos buttons just just everything anything you think of it and it's always like these dumb names too like and and the dumber the name the funnier the person too i swear it's like if you got a really dumb name like you got it good i feel like i i Sometimes there were times where I was like, shoot, man, like my trail name. I wish I had that trail name because that one just is funny as shit. When you meet them, like you crack up hearing it and you're just and then you get to hear the story behind why they got their trail name. And they're always just, yeah, really funny. It's just, yeah, good times. That's really cool. So that's a it's a transformational experience yeah it definitely where is. you go you reinvent yourself you are this new character it doesn't matter who you were before because at this point in time you are this character now mm-hmm. and you need to fulfill this character for the group mm-hmm. that's really awesome yeah it really is it is literally an alternate reality or an alternate ego that's what it is yeah and it's and it's cool too because it's like you get this fresh start and it's like this name that like is chosen for you you know it's not like your parents chose your name and you didn't get to decide like this is named you get you do get to decide your trail name you know nobody gets to decide it for you you know some people will try to get you to go by a certain trail name but but in the end it's your decision if that's the name you want to go by so talk about the hitchhiking and the, yeah, hitchhiking. How did you go about that? What was your system? What did you learn from people? Yeah. So hitchhiking, that was like one of my, one of the biggest fears that I had when before I got on the trail was that because there are hitches that you have to do where you got to hitch like a thousand, not a thousand, like a hundred miles into town. And it might take a couple hitches to get there. And sometimes they can be really reliable and other times they can't. For me, I noticed it was easier the smaller the groups you had. If it was one to two people, it was easier for you to get a hitchhike. If you're in a group of like five people, yeah, you're going to be sitting on that road for a long time. 
for me, it was pretty easy um, because I was a woman and it's, you know, a lot of people are more open to picking up women hikers than they are men. Yeah, (laughs) pretty much privilege. Count it. Um, And I, I didn't have really any bad hitchhikes. I did have one. I had two that were very interesting. One, which was pretty bad. I would say I had a guy that offered me 50 bucks to suck his dick. (laughs) And I said no. And uh, he was very okay about that. He didn't, he didn't like, it was very, put it out there. Yeah, he did. He had to put it out there. And in case you need money. Yeah. And I was like, uh, (laughs) I was like, no man, not doing that period. It definitely made me the hairs on the back of my neck go up. That's for sure. I would imagine. Uh, the good thing was, is he did let me off and he did apologize. So that was good. And it was really fucking awkward after that. Excuse my language. Yep. Um, yep. And then the next one that was really weird. Um, I had this guy who was really paranoid. He was like living out of his, his like Yukon. I guess GMC Yukon and he had a whole bunch of paperwork in his car and he was like essentially calling me a liar because I was telling him that I was through hiking all the way to Canada and he didn't believe how I could be hiking and burning thousands of calories a day and not be losing sustainable amount of weight and how I'm gaining muscle tone. He didn't understand that. I was like, bro, I don't even understand it either because I'm only eating like 2,000 calories a day. I didn't even understand it myself, but I was like, somehow I'm like, I'm me. I'm like, my body's managing. And, and, and he was just very paranoid. He was like telling me all about like some government crap and how he was trying to like, sue the government and that they're like doing all this conspiracy theory crap he was just and he was definitely a weird person so fed smoker it kind of but not on drugs i should say this guy i mean i don't know if he was on drugs he seemed like a pretty straight person for not being on drugs or or if he was on drugs um but he was definitely interesting but i don't even think that was that bad of a hike because i didn't feel like he was a threat to me period he was just more or less just couldn't believe the fact that i was hiking as much and staying skinny and how i couldn't maintain calories and yeah that was pretty much it which i was in the same but i was like bro i don't know i'm like i i I don't know (laughs) i'm like i'm not looking into the science i'm just i'm just hiking my own hike here bro and so yeah so okay so talk about when you made it to the mojave desert yeah so when i made it to the mojave desert um it was really desolate i was more on like the outskirt side of it kind of by lancaster yeah lancaster that's where i was by um and then ended up going up to what is that town yeah i forget what it's called kind of by the town of mojave just on the other side talk about the scorpions the scorpions so i didn't see that many scorpions actually only saw them one time and that was in northern california it was um just past in like the trinity alps right by like mount shasta area that's where i saw them and they were like everywhere it was like bad that night that i saw them i saw like probably like a hundred of them it was gross but didn't see really any scorpions i did see a camel spider while i was out in the mojave desert actually that was gross Mm -hmm. seeing that thing i was like Ew, I can't believe these things even exist on Earth. They're little mandibles. Yeah, they don't even look, like, real Yeah. to me. Like, they look like this, like, really creepy, like, what you would think of, like, out of, of like, a 
horror story, mm-hmm. I swear, of a spider. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like tons of like just random spiders. I don't even know what the hell they were. Just I saw so many different kinds. I saw a lot of bugs at night. I did a lot of night hiking. A lot of it, especially in the southern part because it was so hot Mm. during the daytime. That makes sense. Yeah. And also just like I've never been a morning person ever. Mm -hmm. And so my like ideal hiking schedule was literally for me to like get up at like nine (laughs) o'clock, 10 o'clock, literally eat and get out of my campsite between like the hours of like 10 and noon. And I would hike until about midnight, midnight to one midnight. I'd say about till midnight and then go to bed till like one in the morning. That was like my ideal sleep schedule when I was trekking. And I bet that would help with the a moonlight going. Yeah, it did. And I mean, I had headlamps and stuff like that. And so that and I would just adapt and I liked it a lot because it was really cool seeing just like a different seeing the trail at a different like atmosphere the entire time and you also meet people who have the same schedule as you i met a lot of people who are like night owl people who would be awake all night long just trekking at nighttime and you get to meet them like shoot i remember i met this girl who i met in the desert and she was she was actually um what are they called the people who study bugs oh yeah like an anthropologist not anthropologist or something like that i don't know what they're called but she yeah she was a bug scientist and she was really into bugs and i ran into her a lot in the desert and i didn't see her after like mile like 800 and then i ended up seeing her in packwood and she was still trekking only at nighttime. That was the only time she hiked was at night. She never hiked during the daytime. She was just this owl. Interesting. So night owls exist in the hiking world. Yeah, they do. And there's a lot of day people too. And what I. Time did, at what point did you change your habits? Yeah, so I noticed that I would change a lot of my habits also with groups. Because mm. sometimes I would get in a group, maybe join a new group of hikers and when you join a group what that looks like is is y'all wake up at the same time and y'all leave camp about Mm. the same time and y'all don't hike together but you're like in 10 miles we're going to meet here at this water crossing or this water source or this campsite and we're all gonna eat lunch together Mm -hmm. and they all stay there until the last person shows up in the group and y'all meet there together and you eat lunch if you're really if you're really slow they'll still stay there for you and then they'll just like pick up and then we're like okay we all met up together we all regrouped now we're going to meet we're all going to camp here tonight so this is where we're all going to be sleeping Mm. so we're going to meet here in 10 miles and then they all take off and we all hike at our different pace. And by the end of the night, we're all at that same campsite cooking dinner and going to bed. That sounds fun. Yeah, it is. It's really nice because you're not like bombarded by the same, by everybody. And you can bounce around people to people and you'll Mm -hmm. see the effect. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, I've been in groups where it's been like eight people. And it's kind of nice because I might for like two hours, I might want to like hike with, um, with like Caterpillar for a little bit. And then I might go and hang out with, um, animal style for a minute or Mm -hmm. go and hike out with like, with like jetpack, just like whoever, you know, like you're just like doing, you might just like, just like trek along with them and like talk to them and you get to know them and you're like get to know their story and like who they are like who their family is like what are their values where kind of life did they come from what country are they from you just like get to like have this really in-depth conversation with this person for like two hours while hiking and you might like stop and like take a siesta with them where you just like relax during the heat of the day 
and you like might eat a snack and just talk and and the thing about hiking the PCT is, especially in the beginning, is, is there's a hiker like every five minutes behind you. Mm. So you're not really hiking alone. There's somebody there that's going to come up. So if you were getting in a pickle or in trouble or if you're feeling lonely and you want to talk to somebody, somebody's going to come up right behind you that you could walk with and talk to or just anything. And, and every person is extremely willing to talk to you if you want to talk to them. Like there's, I never met many people that did, gave me the cold shoulder and was like, I'm not going to talk. I don't think that ever actually happened. Every person was willing to talk and you, and you could also just like mutually feel if you know, if somebody didn't want to talk to and it was never anything that was like, gave you a bad vibe or anything. So at what point did you feel alone though? Like, what point was there the least amount of hikers on the trail? Yeah, that was when you got up to Canada, up in Washington. That's when you started to notice a lot of distance between you and the next hiker behind you or in front of you. Well, first of all, you don't know who's in front of you, and you don't really know who's behind you. But but I noticed it was Washington. It was like, I think there was a point where I went like in almost two hours without seeing somebody being behind me or even in front of me just didn't see people so by the time you make it up here you are you're pretty much a rare exception yeah and that's what you notice too when you get up here to Washington you really start to notice that a lot of people are off the trail like a lot of people just didn't make it Mm. and a lot of people don't make it to Canada it's it's actually a rare it's it's very small portion of people population of the through hikers that actually um, go all the yep, way to Canada. Yep, that complete the through hike. Like the one go through hike, not section through hikers, but a full through hiker. What section of the trail was just the longest? Miles wise? For like where you wouldn't want to do it again. It would seem like between San Diego County all the way up to Okanagan. That's I think that's what the last county is. It's Okanagan County. No, like San Diego through San Francisco would be really boring stretch of land to hike. Oh no, not at all. I love that whole stretch. Honestly, all of the sections were like all my favorites. Oh, okay. So I loved the desert section. I actually hated desert hiking until I started hiking the PCT and I fell in love with desert hiking. I think it is so fun. Mm -hmm. It's just, especially California, even just the Southwest, like all of the Southern state desert is just phenomenal. And it's Mm -hmm. so different because I'm just so used to the desert here in Washington where it's just sagebrush and, and like brown and flat there it's like mountainous and just these cool cactus and stuff we don't have cactus here and so seeing cactus in like nature is like was really cool and new for me and I loved it but I would say the boringest section in southern California I would say ooh Oh man, probably from like Green Valley to Lancaster because it was all the trail was closed to there, so it was a lot mm. of uh, road walking. You had to walk on the highway. Um, that was really boring. Um, just because you couldn't actually like hike on the trail because it was closed because of a fire that had ran through there like a year prior and destroyed the trail. So, so that brings up another point. How often did you get lost or lose the trail? I would feel like I would lose the trail a lot. Yeah, I didn't I didn't lose the trail that often. It was actually extremely it's a very extremely well marked trail. It is very well maintained. It's very easy. It's all um graded pretty much all the way through the entire way. The only hardest part was in the Sierras. Because there's a lot of sections, especially when you're in the middle of, like, going over a mountain pass. There really is no trail. It's just straight climbing. Like, it's like, you're like, that's the top there. However way you can get up there, 
you're getting up there like mm-hmm. you're fending you're climbing over boulders and snow fields and ice like how like you're just like that's it right there go to the top climb up however way you choose but that's where the trail is and so there was a lot of that and just trying to navigate. And there's a lot of like, you know, makeshift Karens, like where people would stack rocks to kind of like, like, oh, you, this, there's this way you could go or there's that way. It's just kind of like choose your path in the Sierras. Mm. But outside of the Sierras, it was all very well like maintenance. And I was extremely um, surprised at how well that trail was. And it wasn't even really hard, like physically. Like, it really isn't a hard hike to do. It's very graded and just clean. And even when you go up steep stuff on the PCT, it just, like, the trail's really long. It, Mm -hmm. like, wraps you around, and you go up the hillside, and then you, like, go around, and it just takes a long way. And sometimes you're, like, you're, like, Jesus, I had to hike three extra miles when we could have just gone straight up. Mm. And sometimes you think that you're like, man, if the trail just went straight up, I would have like saved myself some serious time. Yeah. And there was a lot of that where you're a little frustrated, but it was really easy and it's very well um, maintained and very well um, tagged up trail. So you never lost. So talk about your sending packages to yourself. Oh, I'm going to, I'll, while you're doing that, I'll take him and make him drink. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, well, can you keep, keep talking, talking okay. about the, uh, how you would send packages to yourself? Yeah, so I would send packages. Um, so in the beginning, I would I bought, like, a whole bunch of food, went to Costco, bought a whole bunch of, like, North sides, pasta sides, top ramen, like Idaho and instant mashed potatoes, candy, or anything random. Like, you start to notice the hiker diet is just like you want the most le- uh, lightest food that has the most dense amount of calories. That is like the thing um, that all hikers eat. And so when I would, you know, package up them, um, I had to like guess and see how much food I would need in certain distance it was really hard in the beginning because like I would in the very first beginning like I sent a box to myself in Mount Laguna which was 40 miles into the trail and it was like a week's amount of food and then I sent another box to myself in Julian which is like 15 miles away and it was another week's. So I noticed in the beginning, I sent myself a lot of hiker boxes in the very beginning and was ending up dumping them into hiker, um, actually into hiker boxes, which that is something else we can talk about. And, um, and then eventually I got into the, got into the routine very quickly of, okay, this is the amount of food that I need. These are the best meal items to take with me on trail. This is how much food I need. Let's box it up. And then I would package it up. And then I would go to a post office and I would send it to maybe like 500 miles ahead. And I'm like, okay, I'll just send it here. And the good thing is too, is if you sent yourself a package and maybe you get there and you realize you actually don't need that package right away, you could resend it you could like bump it to the next town if you needed to be and I did that actually a couple times where I would have to bump my packages ahead to the next town so that I had food there and yeah so that is what I did you like having another having myself another brisket Or here, I'll talk about hiker boxes because that's what I brought up. Yeah. So what is a hiker box? 
So a hiker box is a communal box of food that other hikers throw in there when they have excess amount of food. Hiker boxes you find out to become very valuable later on in the trail, especially when you start to run out of money, which is a really common thing for a lot of through hikers. They end up becoming pretty broke later on in the trail. And hiker boxes are fun because you can like find some of the most coolest things inside of them. Oh no, he's getting fussy. Oh no, he is. Yes, so it's okay. I'll make him happy. So hiker boxes. Yeah, so I just have my little son here. He's cute. His name's Joseph. (laughs) And Baba Joe, he's a little fussy. It's late. He just wants to cuddle. He just wants to cuddle and go night night. Yeah, you're okay. You're okay. Yeah, so hiker boxes, they're there for hikers that need food and a lot of people will throw things into the hiker box like excess food if they have a package that they're like shoot I went into town and got a resupply but I have this box that I sent to myself I'm not bumping it because I have other boxes there then they'll take that box of food and they'll throw it into this hiker box you can find hiker boxes typically at like outdoor shops a lot of private businesses will have hiker boxes even some of like the post offices that are in like small rural towns will keep a hiker box there for through hikers to go and like get food out of. And they're really important for through hikers that are especially that are broke. Because when you get later on in the trail, a lot of people end up deplenishing their finances. That is one thing that I had kind of came across for myself at times where I was like, shoot, I'm like, money's tight. Had to get some food out of a hiker box till I could get like a trail angel would come and save my day. And I kid you not, the trail always provides. So no matter what you would pray and I kid you not, it would come every time. And it was just, it's, it's really an important thing. And if you are a listener and you want to give back to any through hikers, that's honestly one of the best places that I would dump, um, dump resources into is to hiker boxes, especially if you live up here in Washington state with a lot of the main through hikers come through, just go to like a local store, buy a couple boxes of some chop ramen or size pasta sides, snacks anything throw those into the any hiker box you see because through hikers are going to really appreciate that the most so it sounds like a hiker box is the food donation boxes it is it is you're just calling a hiker box it is it is it is the food it is a food day yeah too why not yeah and it is and it's kind of nice too because you might get bored of eating the same that food gets wasted anyway you know yeah at least somebody's using it it definitely does but it but I'd say more north it doesn't and there's a lot of things too where you could do if you really are like going on the trail really broke just a little tip here's a little tip from Sarah from your girl blossom I should say um if you're in the beginning and you are going on to this hike with no money I would suggest you just hang it out in like Mount Laguna collect all the food you can out of the hiker box package that shit up and send it north for yourself later on (laughs) because it it, they get harder to find cooler stuff in hiker boxes the more north you go versus in those first couple towns you come across that would be my best advice because you'll save money in the long run so yeah it is that's i that's what all me and a whole bunch of other through hikers talked about all a few times um at camps and stuff at night we're like man if we had done that in the beginning we could have saved so much money but it is it's the food donation box and it is a communal donation box so it it seems like your ability to manage your finances going through will um, determine whether or not you'll finish Yes, and kind of. Honestly, my 
yeah, my idea of finishing, it's kind of a lot like how I listened to this interview with like this Navy SEAL guy. And you're probably familiar with this term as being a Marine. He used this like this theory of how like Marines complete missions. It's like confidence. You have to be really confident. You have to look out for your team. Um, you have to always kind of know where you're going. Like you need to have self-awareness is like really part of it. Mm. It's it's kind of like I, I like listening to I wish I knew. I wish I had it pulled up on me to know what it was. But no, I met a lot of people who were really broke. I met people who started I met this guy. His trail name was KP. He started the PCT with two hundred dollars and he blew it within the first like week. And that guy literally made it to Canada. And he literally made it off of, kid you not, by fate. Faith, man. Fate and faith made him finish that trail. And he was so confident that he was going to Canada. And that literally is what made him go. He believed in himself. And he, because of him believing himself, and he just... I don't know how he did it, but he'd managed, he figured out how to do it and he made it to Canada off of 200 bucks, 200 bucks that he blew within the first week. He made, he made it. And, and I mean, granted, he was a bit of a smoocher himself, mm -hmm. but, and the thing is, is like, like the PCT is kind of a bit of this like unitopian society that kind of works. And that's mm -hmm. how it is for like the AT and the CDT because everybody's working towards the same destination. Everybody wants to help everybody get there. And everybody's kind of will do anything to make sure you get there. We're all looking out for each other and they're on our best intentions. And everybody, um, yeah, everybody's looking out for each other for best intentions. And like, people are willing to like give their money to other through hikers like other through hikers are okay with financially helping one another because we just have this bond and love and the cool thing is 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 like there's an end stamp to it so it's not like this can go on for years you know there's a timeline where it's going to stop and that is either until you as a through hiker are just done through hiking or it's until you get to Canada or until the snow falls it's one of the two. Yeah. So beating the snowfall. Talk about that and that anxiety. Yeah. That was a lot. So for me, I got to Canada a week before the Cascades got completely socked in with snow for the winter. Um, the day that I actually made it to Canada, it had snowed. It, there was snow everywhere on the ground that morning. It was cold. It ended up turning into... It snowed the morning and then it turned into cold rain throughout the rest of the day. And it sucked because I was completely drenched. Basically, like almost, uh, it, I was so cold. I was, it was ridiculous. I, it kind of sucked because when I got to the northern termis, like, it's like this amazing feeling. You're like, wow, I did it. And you're like, wow now what <laughs> you're like now I walk back because like I walked back with some with uh some people that just we couldn't get into Canada you have to go through customs forms and all that I didn't get any of that stuff in in time so I literally went into Canada just like spun around went and took a piss and then uh, walked back to the United States right through the clear cut and yeah and it was just freezing and then like yeah after i got done i believe it yeah it was a week later the snow came and it stuck it the winter had come and i was really thankful that i made it to canada and there was there was a lot of anxiety and there was a lot of myself questioning my ability and the weather and being like am i going to make it to canada like am i gonna be able to make it through before winter comes before the snow comes through the north cascades like there was a lot of that because there was a lot of mornings where I was up in high altitude and it did snow that night 
And I was like, shoot. And also every night it was getting below freezing. It was getting cold. Even in the days, it was like getting into the 60s, 40s. And a lot of rain in Washington I was experiencing and just starting to kind of feel a little bit miserable in that sense. And so there was a lot of that kind of self bargaining of like, is this going to happen? Is this what's going to happen here? Yeah, that's kind of kind of frightening. And then, but you made it. So, but you did it in you did it in six months. What's the likelihood of doing it sooner? Oh, way likely. I honestly, the reason. So, mine was almost six months. I think it was like five months and three weeks. But basically like six months and I could have done it sooner I took a lot of zero days and zero days are days where you don't hike you just you're not on the trail it's like you're stuck in towns and towns at times become your worst enemy because they turn into vortexes where you don't want to leave them you get comfortable being in like you know you're next to your phone you have internet you can like you're next to warm meals, food, anything like it's all it's easier there to be homeless than it is <laughs> to be on the trail. Yeah, pretty much. And it's also fun, too, because you run into a lot of through hikers. And like, that's a thing, too. Like, there's a lot of times where I get stuck in a, in a town vortex where it's like I'm there. And then all of a sudden I'm like getting ready to pack up. But then but then like biggie smalls comes rolling in and i haven't seen her in like two weeks and she's got this crazy story and then like uh pinata comes in too and i haven't seen him in like probably like 500 miles or a thousand miles and i want to talk to them like they're really cool people and so you're just wanting you don't you don't feel ready to leave their presence and and there's also like people you see in your group and you're not quite or not yeah in your group bubble that you're like oh i kind of want to hang out with them in town because you see them in almost every town and you're just like not quite ready to leave so they it, it's hard it's definitely hard to leave towns that is for sure um and what was their question again? Well, the, well, I mean, you can you could do it quicker than six months. Yes. If you okay, that's what to I said. Like yeah, that's what I said. Go quicker. Yeah, that's where I was getting at. So yeah, you get stuck in a lot of vortexes. And for me, I could have done it a lot quicker. Like if I took off all the days that I had taken off, because like, for instance, I took two weeks off to help you and your family move oh, here yeah, to Washington. Yep. Mm-hmm. And when I got up to Washington, I ended up taking a week off of trail. Mm -hmm. And then almost every pass that I came across, I took days off. I took a lot of time off in some of the towns where I take maybe like two, three days off. So honestly, in total, I probably took almost like a month and a half of trail days off of zero days mm -hmm. on my accumulation in the six months of just zero days where didn't do anything. Yeah. And so if you took that, I guess technically it would probably have taken me four months to do the whole trail, not including zero days, but the whole process yeah, is six months, almost six months. Yeah. But so yeah, I some rest days. Though. Yeah. But That's I had a lot of work. Oh yeah. But I had met some people that I met in the beginning or just one time passer through and then I'd see them on social media and they're like in August and they had already made it to Canada. And I kid you not, these people were pulling like 30 mile days. They were just, just like crushing through, which I never really honestly understood people who could do that mm -hmm. because I don't know. I feel like there's no fun in just like dedicating to just like just killing. Just killing. Yeah, just straight like just through hiking, not absorbing anything. Like you can't even really get attached to people when you are like marathoning mm -hmm. it, basically. The through hike experience. Mm -hmm. Like 
one of the biggest part of being a through hiker is the camaraderie of the trail society like the people you meet that's that's the biggest reason why I think most people stay is because it's the people that you befriend and you make these amazing connections with other through hikers and it's just it's like this soul connection you make with every person that you meet and it's like how would you want to just keep passing on just just keeping your head down and just trekking and not stopping and then to to like talk to people and to really like form real like connections and I met a lot of people well not a lot but I met quite a few people that were just only in there for the through hike they weren't in there for the for the experience yeah yeah there's people that I I met that were like I'm gonna try to beat the record or they were on like a, a strict time frame mm-hmm. like maybe they could only get like two four months off of work so they're like I gotta get all this done in four months so they're you know they're pulling 30 40 mile days mm-hmm and they have like the lightest pack ever and it's just i'm like that's just not fun i would rather yeah so gear weight yeah so, so i had a buddy who said that some people would like take out if it was double stitch they'd take out one stitch you know so it's single stitch oh yeah people break their toothbrushes in half everything yeah well, so what sort of like little trail hacks is there to lighten stuff yeah there is so honestly what i would suggest if you're going to do weight wise i would try to stay down on your your tent and stuff like that um honestly in the beginning you don't even need a tent you're gonna be honestly i did a lot of cowboy camping which is when you sleep not in a tent you just sleep with a yeah you just sleep under the stars with like your mattress pad and your sleeping bag i did a lot of cowboy camping and that was especially in the desert if you're cool with that pack your backpack or your tent and send it north for till you get to the till you get up to cal like uh the sierras or somewhere where you feel like you need it you know you could bring a little little fly or something a little tarp or something and you'll even a little piece of tyvek tarp would even save you time to just like put a little shelter if it started to rain in the nighttime and you needed to to like um take shelter Mm -hmm. you'd be fine but shooting at that time you could just i would just keep trekking through the night if it was raining like that um I remember you had your your fancy light tent. Yes, I did. I called. did. I had a big Agnes. Agnes um, yeah. What was it? A big Agnes fly fly two person tent or something like that. Worst tent ever. I hate mm-hmm. big Agnes. Don't suggest that tent to anybody. It's it's garbage. They leak through. It's like too thin. It's not good quality. And what like, is a good tent? Honestly, a good tent is like Z-Pack tents. Those are really good. They're very expensive. And they're, but however, though, they're extremely lightweight, durable. Mm-hmm. Um, If you want a good tent that is worth your bang and your buck and it's good quality, I suggest Sierra Design. They have okay. a really good tent, especially their Moonlight, too. That's a really good tent. I love that tent. It's pretty lightweight. It's good quality, um, and it's not that expensive. It's it's a more cheaper um, alternative for backpacking tents. Um, but yeah, so if you're gonna go lightweight, I would not skimp out on your tent, your sleeping bag for sure. I would try to go for a lighter sleeping bag. Your cooking wear. A lot of people in the beginning bring a lot of unnecessary cooking stuff. That was me. I brought like two pots. (laughs) I brought like two pot, like two big pots that I never need. You just need one solid little pot that can, that can do it. And I did like a little pocket rocket, tiny little stove. Um, you know, get a decent sized little fuel canister. Um, you know 
clothes. You don't really need that many clothes. And I brought a lot of clothes in the beginning that I thought I needed. Like I brought like a pair of clothes that I needed for town clothes. Mm. And when you get into through hiking, you don't need no town clothes. You're wearing your smelling clothes wherever you go. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the times like shoot, I didn't wash my clothes very often. I think I only washed my clothes maybe 10, 10 times total while I was through hiking. And majority of the time, almost, I'd say eight out of those 10 times, they were at some trail angels house that I w- went and washed them and they provided clothes for me to wear like a spare of their clothes. They were like, oh, here you can stay in my house. Like, here's like a pair of like sweatpants and a t-shirt you can wear while we wash your clothes. Mm-hmm. And so I would do that. That's how it always worked out for me. Yeah. How did you find these trail angels? Yeah. So trail angels, it was kind of cool. They just kind of came out of the woodworks. Like it, a lot of them, you would meet uh, hitchhiking. I met trail angels when I was... Uh, like I met some trail angels train trail angels when I was like trekking into town and they're like going back to the same town because they live in that town and they're like oh yeah like do you you know I'm they want to continue hearing my story so they'd be like I'll pay for you to have dinner you know you can come over to my house and then they're like do you want to stay here and I'm like yeah I don't want to like, I'm, if you don't, I'm going to go fall asleep in a park. <laughs> I'm going to go sleep in this field over here or just behind Safeway. Like, that's where I was planning on sleeping. But since you're insisting, like, allowing me to sleep on your couch, I'd rather stay there. Um, some towns, like, you'd go into, like, a... Because a lot of these towns are really small. So there's always, like, these little small mom-and-pop grocery stores. There's really not many box store grocery stores. And in those little small ones, there would be like, um, you, some of them you could find like a flyer of like multiple trail angels. Also there's the PCT, there's Facebook groups, like there's a PCT trail angels, Facebook group page. And like, I was a part of that. So if I needed a place, I could just post on there and be like, Hey, I'm in, um, I'm here in uh bend oregon and i'm here for the night and i'm needing a place to stay and i also need a ride out tomorrow morning to get back on the trail is there anybody here and then somebody will post and be like yeah i'm here like where are you at and they'll i would just link up with them so there was a lot of that but honestly most of the time it was always just like this like this miracle essentially of like just the stars aligning perfectly where the right person would just come at the right time and be there at the right moment where I need that person to be and they would help me and it was yeah really cool yeah you talked about at one point how people would teach you how to be frugal yeah it and really where to go to get food and where to go to get whatever. Oh no, Baba Joe. Baba Joe, you were being good. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, so places yeah, so I learned a lot about how to be frugal. Oh, you might need to stop here for a second with him. Okay. Joseph Eugene. Situational awareness. Yeah, mm-hmm. situational awareness. That's a life skill. Yeah, well, you definitely need situational awareness when hiking the PCT. I'm going to let you know that because there's a lot of situations. It's you're out there all alone. There's people out there and you got to know your awareness. You got to know where you're at on the trail. You got to know who is near you, who's in front of you. Like, who do you know who's in front of you? And who do you have an idea who's behind you? Because if some sh- something were to go down, you need to know who you're going to turn to within, like, minutes, hours, anything. You, even, like, your just geographic awareness. You need to just know, like, be able to read read the situation very well that is a big skill to have 
when trucking. Yeah. So situational awareness, how does that help with being frugal too? Like it does. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Being frugal. How does that help you? So yeah, being frugal. I learned a lot. One of the biggest thing there, um, on the PCT, I had met another through hiker and same situation. He basically started the PCT with not money, not much money. And I kid you not, he taught me so much about how to, how to be street smart. I didn't know anything about how to be street smart. Like I'm like very privileged woman, like mom and dad able to take care of me. I was also very sustainably independent too. Like had uh, my own job and everything before. Like I knew how to, you know, never and needed to ever be street smart to get through life ever. Never had been in a situation like that. So when I was on the PCT, I hiked a lot with this person who quite literally taught me how to become street smart. Um, like he's really good at like befriending like homeless people. And I kid you not, like homeless people are kind of a good people to meet when you run into a town because they're going to tell you where you can get a free shower. They're going to tell you where free meals are. And they're going to also tell you where in areas of town you can't sleep at. Like very important. Yeah, intro. it is very important because a lot of the times when I would go into towns, I would never, I, I mean, I just never really stayed in hotels and stuff because they're super expensive. I always opted to go stay in a park or sleep on the outskirts of town. That's just where I did. I, I rarely ever slept in, I think I slept in maybe four hotels my whole entire experience and like two hostels total. So about six establishments. Other places were most of the time trail angels or just sleeping in a field outside of town. That was kind of, or in the woods or baseball fields, parks, anything. That's just where I would go. And homeless people always did. I ate at a few food banks for like meals. I always did my justice back. I would always like clean up and help with all of their stuff afterwards. And it was really sweet because they would always like give me an extra like meal to go afterwards. Yeah, it was really, yeah, it was really sweet. So I would at least like give back with like time and labor afterwards. Um, yeah and like just like that's just what the homeless did and and that became really crucial and this other person then like he taught me a lot about like how to hitchhike like how to know how to hitchhike how to read somebody when you're hitchhiking like what kind of people you shouldn't like you should just be like oh, i'll catch the next one or something like that situations this really taught me that situational awareness and, you know, and he did a lot of hiker boxes in the beginning. So I learned a lot about how to use a hiker box system in the beginning just by observing his life and how he was moving through the trail. And I was like, shoot, okay, this is a good mental note. Like, this is how you do resupply through just a hiker box. So interesting. So it, and he, it pretty much, uh, so watching how that person operates influenced your operations too. So what other people were influential to how you navigated the trail and what other things did you notice like patterns that people did that were efficient? Yeah. So other people taught me, um, yeah, a lot of other people taught me like, um, efficiency, for instance, like I met another through hiker, like in the beginning, cause my date, my through pack was huge. I had a through hiker teach me how to pack my backpack correctly. Oh, okay. So you had to learn it all. Yeah, I did. I'd learn it all. And that was a huge influence. That was like a core memory for me on that one. Um, I had people teach me how to find the best effective food like what is the best like meals 
tons of that was the one thing that I liked about eating dinner with different hikers because everybody had different meals that were they were into so you would learn like different mm. menus because after a while if you eat top ramen for like two weeks straight you get tired of eating it and you're like I need to make something different mm -hmm. um so that was really fun just sharing um different um dinner ideas like meal ideas with other people trading food um um, how to fix things too. Like if your, you know, your tent were to break, how to fix it. I've met, I've met through other hikers that taught me how to do just those kind of skills. How to fix my air mat, my my mattress pad. Didn't know how to do that. I had a through hiker teach me how to patch my own mattress pad. Never knew how to do it ever till then. But just duct tape. Yeah, duct tape. There's like patches you can buy. Like there's one guy who had. A, I had like multiple patches on that he carried on him and just taught me how to patch it myself. So you just carry rubber cement and rubber patches? Yeah, they're kind of like this. Yeah, like a rubber. It's not cement. It's like a goop mm -hmm. type solution, yeah. kind of like a Gorilla Glue yeah. type thing. And then you just kind of blow the air and you find the hole and then you just smack it on there. So a patch repair kit would be a good thing to have to hike with maybe no okay i would use duct tape and i would put take off a chunk of duct tape and i'd tape it tape it around your trekking pole and then i would use that as a temporary solution until you can get to a town to fix it that's what i would do mm. that is my best advice on that one Okay, that's golden advice because yeah. you would have thought. Yeah, that's what I would do. And I've had to do that. But yeah, it's just like little mundane things like that that other through hikers would like leave wisdom with me. You know, they'd give me their wisdom advice and I would just, I'm like, wow, that makes total sense. I'm like, thank you. And I would just like um, correct myself by what their advice and wisdom was and by what they live by good that's a good way that's a great way of growth and self-discovery to the point where you are the one of the few that make it all the way to the canadian border mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and the kind of people that make it to canada it is you notice in the end we all have similar the same kind of value beliefs in the end i've noticed that okay so for instance like everybody who made it to canada one you have to be confident in yourself you can't doubt yourself ever on the trail and that was one thing about myself from the get-go i never thought that i wouldn't make it to canada i was very determined i was like no matter what happens and the more i got comfortable on trail the more i noticed like it it, I was going to make it to Canada. The only way I wasn't going to make it is if I got severely injured. And if I got injured, to me, if I got injured or if other people got injured, to me, that was literally God saying to that person that this was not your time to go. Mm. Like, that is that is out of anybody's element, injuries are. Like, you can't prevent an injury. That is, that's kind of on a, a higher power, I should say. Um, so determination, that is key. The second is, is embracing and like coming into suffering. You have to embrace the suffering of the trail and like accept it for what it is like self acceptance of the suffering and just like learning to love it. So that means like accepting that you're this, you know, accepting your trail angel or your, um, your trail name accepting help accepting like this is what it is like my feet are gonna hurt every day but I'm still going to like get up and I'm still gonna keep tracking and I'm still going to like take in the day and like love it I'm still going to be open-minded and that's the thing too is being open-minded is like another key to getting yourself there self-awareness is another way to getting you um, to Canada and 
Uh, there was just like so many other little detail things that I noticed that so many people did when I got to Canada. Like the people, like everybody who just fully embraced it and was confident, they all made it. People who just doubted themselves a little bit, they never made it there. Uh, also, if you're really homesick, like if you're just, you have a hard time adapting and you're really homesick, you just, just know it's going to be a really struggle for you to get there. You have to really just let go and just accept the suffering and just love it. Like love the pain, love everything that is going to come your way. Like take it, take in the punches and roll with them because that is all you can do. And that is one of the greatest gifts that the PCT taught me is just being able to just like let into my suffering and to accept it and to just stay confident with with who I am and like what I'm doing in life and you can you're you're on fire like you are untouchable if you are like that like life is going to be a lot easier for you if you just have those determination Mm-hmm. and mindset any goal you will be able to tackle it and I remember being done with hiking the PCT and I just was like wow like and I still think that to this day like especially when I have moments where I'm like having self-doubt even as like a mom or work or anything and just right now in the present I will sometimes have to think back to like being blossom on the PCT and being like, you know what, that, that person, I need that. I need a bit of that. Um, I need a bit of her to come out right now and like be here. You know, I need that alter ego to kick in a little bit because I need that to push me through. I need to that reminding myself that I I did the PCT like I have this confidence in myself that I had I believed in myself then and I can believe in myself right now and when I do that like when when I refocus myself I'm just like yep and then I can kick through and I can get anything done and I know that like I'm unstoppable and anybody can be and so yeah sorry that was a bit of like a whole little tangent there (laughs) no that's what people need they need that sort of motivation they do and that's literally what that is how it is and that is how it is in anything you do in today and i just want anybody's listening like that is what you need if you are struggling anything like it is self-confidence and it is about surrendering yourself to your suffering because suffering is a very beautiful thing and I think people have really um they're afraid and it is okay to be afraid like I remember when like I think about when I the beginning of the hike in the PCT I was so fucking scared is one of the most scariest moments of my life and taking that first step to accepting your your fate and the suffering that's going to happen is that is very scary but it's also extremely brave and that is the thing too when you're hiking the pct you got to be a brave person you Mm. really do you gotta you gotta you you really have to be a brave individual seems like it yeah you really do because you're out there by yourself yeah in the middle of nowhere yeah and that's the thing like the, the more you get desert, the, yeah the more been, days that go by the by a rattlesnake yeah and then how have you thought about that like what if i get i'm sure did you what were the contingencies in your head were like if you're walking along bam rattlesnake freaking bit you just oh cause. dude yeah just because yeah, I had definitely had like some intrusive thoughts like that mm-hmm. where like I was like, oh, man, I'm like, is there going to be a, like a rattlesnake? And it's really weird, too, because I had a lot of intuition. Um, I feel like that's just kind of one of my natural superpowers of being mm-hmm. like who I am as an individual is I I feel like I have pretty good intuitional um, awareness. Mm-hmm. And for instance, like there was this day where I was like trekking and I instantly had this intuition like overwhelm me where I was like there's something dangerous ahead of me and I had to slow down and I just like the closer I got to it I had more of this fear and there was a rattlesnake like 
like around the corner like 15 like like two like 30 second walk ahead of me there was a rattlesnake all coiled up and everything and then I waited for the next person to come by and the good thing is is he was a trail he was a trail angel for me in that situation because he had a uh, sunshade umbrella Mm-hmm. And he like popped his umbrella open and he like put it, he like shielded the rattlesnake and another person came up behind us. And then there was like three of us. We were all shielded by this umbrella because this rattlesnake couldn't bite through this umbrella and see us. So it just like shielded us as we all walked past it. Why don't I just walk around it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't want to do, none of us wanted to do that because what if there's more rattlesnakes in the area you know it's all thick thick like desolate like desert and cactuses and shit like that all around it oh i guess that was the most efficient thing to do he <laughs> just walks up covers, yeah i mean yeah he covers it like steve Irwin with an umbrella and yeah everybody walks right by it, uh, everybody walked by and it was just like only i could be in that situation and be safe you know like it was just that was my f- that was just uh, like a moment of just you know it was like a miracle it was a blessing and yeah so that was you know that was definitely like an intrusive thought and I mean I've had a lot of intrusive thoughts of like oh man what if I like roll off this cliff and die (laughs) you know I'm like holy crap like what if that happens like I remember when I was going over um snow call me pass to Stevens pass there was a lady that day like earlier that day and she fell to her death and like her person that she was walking with we I ran across her that day and that like that whole day I had intrusive thoughts I was gonna fall off the cliff too Later, they ended up finding her because uh, one of my friends lived in, because uh, this was in Kittitas County where this happened. Later, came on the news after like a week once I got to, over to Stevens Pass. They told me, they're like, yeah, this woman ended up falling off the PCT the day that you went back on it and died. And I'm like, holy crap, they found her. And yeah, and she like fell like 2,000 feet. Holy shit. Yeah, off this mountainside. Down like this boulder field. Are you familiar with that area? Yeah. Yeah, so it's literally like when you're hiking the PCT office uh, going north on Snoqualmie Pass. And yeah, she like fell to her death. And it was just crazy like seeing. Some random shit. Huh? Yeah, and it, was a, and it was a day hiker. It wasn't a through hiker at all. It was nobody mm. that we I knew of or any other through hikers. Okay. But it was just like crazy because like I ran into the person that she was day hiking with. And that person was absolutely frantic. And for me, like I was like, oh, well, I'll keep an eye out. You know, I didn't think anything of it past that moment. You know, that this person's actually, like, died, you know, until I got to, got to Stevens Pass and I went to Wenatchee and found out later, like a week later, that this person actually ended up dying. But that day, though, I had, like, intrusive thoughts of, like, me rolling off, like, the mountainside or that I would slip and, because it was steep, dude, like, like, the north, like, the Cascades through Stevens so I'm still calling me past the students past very beautiful section highly recommend it anybody who's going to want to do a section through hike of the PCT really great spot through that section um but it is it is sheer cliffs it's a lot of spines um that you go on that you're walking along on through that section damn yeah so don't fuck around yeah yeah or you'll find out you'll find out <laughs> yeah Jesus. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it reminds me of when we were, when Ryan took a shit. Because I was talking about that on a, another podcast about how, how I still have the scar on my arm from Mount Adams. Oh, yeah. Freaking A, yeah. 
Yeah, well, that's that literally was... like what happened to this woman, you know, freaking mm-hmm. falling. Yeah, I know. That was so scary that day. Yeah, it was a scary day. I know. Dude, but we learned a lot from we that. A lot. We learned a lot of lessons. About mountaineering and volcanoes and glaciers and not being stupid because I was like going hard. And I was thought I could, I was like, yeah. Yeah. It's just all's well that ends well. Yeah, definitely learned a lot on that. Yeah, I could have been fucked up. I could have had something broken. If I had something broken, then it would have been like a whole nother level exponentiating. Oh, I know. Then Nicholas Nicholas would have come and save us. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. And I and I remember the next day when after Ryan hit the bottom of the rocks, (laughs) sliding down the glacier uncontrollably, and then I thought. Man, he's lucky he didn't break nothing. And because we talked about that, we were like, fuck. How the hell would we even communicate? Because I had no service. Yeah. Like, I didn't have shit. How are you going to communicate or talk anybody on to where specifically you are? Mm -hmm. It's so difficult. Yeah. So, yes, there is danger in it. So, Mm -hmm. but hey, all's well that ends well. We learned a lot, though. Oh, dude, for real. We've learned a lot. I know, and that's the thing. Like, a lot of, like, excursions and stuff, you know, going out into the wilderness, Mm -hmm. you learn a lot, you know. There's this, like, beautiful saying that uh, our uncle Mm -hmm. says. um, And one thing, um, when you go out into the wilderness, you become skookum. Skookum, huh? Yep. Okay. And that's what he says to me. He's like, "Oh, you're now a skookum and and high in backpacking, which means like I'm like a Native American mm. status. Like I can be out there in the wilderness and like survive because I've skookumed. Like I have figured I have become like the top chief chi of like being in the wilderness." And I definitely felt like that, you know, towards the end. Like, I, like, after I got done through high gain, like, I could, I can still light a fire in, like, rain. (laughs) Like, I can, like, I was lighting fires every night, pretty much almost all my entire trek. And that's one thing that I got skookum to. Like, I figured out how to achieve that, like, very well. Like, I can start them anywhere. Like I could get lost in the woods with nothing and I could probably start a fire. Like I've become that, I, be, I became that good at doing it. Hmm. Yeah. You know, the ancient Greeks would call that techne. Techne. Yeah. yeah. Anything that you have that you can use that's a sort of a skill, a mm-hmm. power, a knowledge. Yeah. And that's how I feel like I had become towards the end and that's how i feel like every almost every individual through hiker became we we all like basically got this like life skill of being a skookum backpacker like we could go into any we could continue on backpacking and we just learned so many life skills in that time frame because i mean shoot we were literally living out of all of us were literally living out of a backpack Mm -hmm. it was our home and we all knew what to do and we all knew how to stand up and like stand our ground if something were to come after like you know if a bear were to come in and try to take my food i came to the point like i would fight them (laughs) like i had a night where i had deer coming into my campground or my campsite and i was all by myself camping alone like nobody was with me just me and I kept having these deer coming in and trying to like lick my, um, my like pot because I left my pot outside, mm-hmm. uh, like my my cooking pot. my cooking pot, and I had like a little bit of food residue in it, and it was mm-hmm. right next to my like tent, like like a foot away. And it could have been a bear. And I'm hearing it like jingle right next to my head, and I'm freaked out, and. I like started to curl up into this fear mode and I was like, you know what? No, this is a life or death situation. You know what I mean? Like this, my food is laying right next to me. Cause I had it, I slept with it at night. Oh, 
And I was like, I cannot let this bear take my food. <laughs> and I was like, there's only two things I can do right now. I can either take it or I'm going to go and stand up. So I literally just like got myself prepared. And I opened my tent up real quick and I was like, Rah! Just like yelling and stuff. I was like, damn here. <laughs> like yeah, just started deer, throwing luckily. started throwing shit anywhere. Like could barely see because it was dark too. There was no moonlight out or anything. And it was just this this buck. Like this big buck mm -hmm. deer just fucking with me. And that deer fucked with me all night long. I kept having to like shoo him out of my campsite and he'd still come wandering back in and like wanting to just like mess with my shit. And I kept having to like throw crap at it and everything and just yelling at it. It was, it was torture. <laughs> oh damn Dude, he, so you got he, tortured by a deer i did by a big old buck oh, too he was buck. big he was a big boy it, the good thing was he wasn't scared of me i mean most and it of wasn't a bear yeah it wasn't well, a and he wasn't scared of you he saw you <laughs> as a weaker creature with food yeah i know he definitely wasn't but i and the thing was is it was to that point where i was just not scared of I was not scared of that deer either. I It was just, you just learn to just not be afraid. And that's part of that skookumness, you know, mm -hmm. like all the other hikers, you just get into that zone where you're like, I'm going to like, you fear nothing essentially towards the end. You, you just, all of your, your worries and fears are just go out. You overcome them, mm -hmm. become more and more brave and more courageous good point yeah it is and that's where everybody you know it's part of the beautiful life skills you get from through hiking that just carry on with you forever yeah i wish more people would consider that as an option for i do too transformational things it wasn't even on my radar as a thing until you brought it up and how much you talk about it mm-hmm yeah i know i wish more and more people would do that it's honestly like now that i'm a mom that is one of my biggest things that i want my kids to do in their life is to go on a backpacking journey i don't care how long it is i don't care if you're doing it like you know as long as it's over 100 miles that's all i care about as long as you're doing a solid week out in um out in the nature cool mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, even if you're just backpacking through, like, hostels in Europe, that's even cool to do. I definitely wish more and more people would do it because you're living this, like, simple life. And mm -hmm. when you live a simple life, everything that's, like, ego and everything just dies. Mm -hmm. It's all about just the simplicity of just doing the same repertory thing. It's It's... It's just really, it's very, you learn a lot about yourself doing those things, just living simple. And that's, was like one of the nicest things you really, I learned a lot about myself doing that. And I feel like I want that for my kids to experience that at least once in their lifetime. They don't have to go through hike the PCT, but I mean, it'd be cool if they did. That'd be really cool. Or like this, the at or the cdt and also like doing that is like the best way to like see a country if you really want to experience a country go backpack their land don't stay out of the city go walk through go walk through these little towns go get picked up by these people who are from these small towns like they're going to tell you everything you need to know they're going to be the most welcomest people. It's going to be one of the most positive experiences you could ever experience. And like doing it will like really restore your faith in, in humanity. Cause it definitely did that with me. And I still have faith in humanity to this day, even with everything that's wild going on in the world. Like just because I know that there's, there's more good in the world than there is bad. Mm -hmm. And it really is. And we're humans. And, like, we're all still trying to strive to, you know, we're all trying to strive to really be bit greater than what we are. And, and we all, like, you know, we're all going to mess up and stuff. But 
as long as you're striving, you know, you're doing good. And that's what I've really realized more and more the older I've gotten and just having still have faith in, in life and humans. Shit, if I was a trail angel, I'd start a podcast. I know, yeah. Yeah, that'd... you'd probably meet all sorts of unique people in I life. I know. And you'd have no shortage of, well, maybe during the winter time. Yeah. I wonder how much. You it's... could just, like, record a whole bunch of them all at once, you know? Mm-hmm. You could be like, uh, you know, you could, like, interview, like, like five through hikers in a day and then just like oh, yeah. break it up you know what i mean that's five weeks you could just post one of their interviews every week mm -hmm. and get it all done which i did do a few like little interviews and stuff it was actually really funny there was this film festival documentary that got put out which is called journey by foot um i didn't I fully watch it um but there were like these Asian people and stuff and it was really funny because like they did an interview with me and they were asking me questions. I was like at this really beautiful lakes um, called Thousand Island Lakes in the Sierra Nevadas. And there was like this Asian crew. They were like all from China. Like some of them barely spoke English. And they're like asking me questions about my trail experience and stuff. And I'm, like, sitting there just, like, eating food and, like, chomping on food in my interview, like, talking mm -hmm. with my mouth all full. And they're, like, Art, do you have any concerns about you, like, not making it to Canada? And I was, like, nope, I have none. They're, like, well, what if you, like, like uh, break your leg or something? I was, like, it's not going to happen. I was, like, I'm not breaking my leg. I was, like, I'm not getting. I was, like, well, what if you run out of money or something like that? And I was, like still making it to Canada I was like explaining like all the ways of how I was going to get it get there and I was like saying I was like I was like the trail provides and that's like a saying too the trail provides um you know when things get rough that's a thing that a lot of hikers will say to each other is like the trail will provide like it's kind of like keep your chin up like have faith in God you know like you're not going to be not heard or seen like like as long as you ask for it and you want it like it's gonna happen for you and it does it always it always does it, it always worked out every time damn yeah it was it's very beautiful it is a very big pilgrimage especially for your faith with god like most definitely it'll definitely bring you close religiously with god and there's also times, too, where I saw the trail also not do that for people, too. Mm. Like, I saw I saw some people get into drugs when I was on the trail and spun out. I watched somebody sp spin out of sobriety when I was on the trail. Never. have I've only seen that one time ever playing in front of my face, and I watched it happen in one night. It was crazy. Somebody who was, like, sober for, like, two years. Who like broke their sobriety and like spun out bad. Damn. Yeah. And went on a whole like drugs and alcohol binge for like a week. So clearly getting hard drugs is not an issue on the trail. No. Probably not in all the small towns. No, it really isn't. I mean, I don't really know who you would get that mm -hmm. stuff from. I mean, still to this day, because that's just not, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't use drugs or anything like that. I mean, I guess if somebody was going there to get sober like that movie with Reese Witherspoon yeah the wild and yeah. that's the thing that's one of the most common questions on the trail they're like oh you're a PCT hiker and I'm like yeah and they're like oh have you seen the movie wild <laughs> that is the most common statement oh did, did you see the movie wild they're like are you hiking it because of the movie wild and I'm like no honey I'm hiking it because I start I found out about the PCT when I was a kid and like I grew up in Washington near the PCT, you know, like like I know about it from that. And uh so that was a really common which and then and it also the PCT blew up also because of that book too. A lot of people mm -hmm. got on it because of that hike as well. Or the the book I mean. Started hiking it because that book inspired them to do that. And, yeah, I met a lot of people who actually started hiking it 
because of sobriety. Mm. Yeah, I met a few people who became sober. And the veterans. Yes. With their transitional stuff. So talk about that. Yeah, I met a lot of veterans when I was hiking the PCT. There was a lot of them. Um, I met this really cool through hiker, really awesome dude. His name's Wing It. And he he did a lot he inspired me a lot as far as like um just like how he lives his life like man like man's like true to his word like still to this day like he was like I'm going to be you know my goal is to through hike all three trails kayak all the Mississippis or in the, all these rivers and and bicycle across the United States and like bro has delivered I like shout out to him like very impressed with his life he is such a moving individual I'm so glad that I got to meet him and he is a big advocate for veterans and um yeah so he did there's a lot of veterans I met out there that did a lot of fundraising for um you know like just awareness like the Oh, what is it called? There's like the Semper Fi Fund. Mm -hmm. There is Wounded Warriors Project. I think mm -hmm. that's what it is when it's like wounded people mm -hmm. from military. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of people. Oh, and a crazy thing, which I mean, it's not really crazy. I feel like the military is a lot like the PCT. I mean, I'm not a military person, but from what I can tell from how you've described it, you being a veteran... And a lot of other veterans that I've met, it is very similar. It's mm -hmm. like that brotherhood. Um, the PCT is very much brotherhood, sisterhood, bonding. You know, you're making lifelong connections. You could be away from these people and you can easily pick up right where you left off years down the road. And just have this sense of like soul connection with these people forever like they could die and you could meet them again in in heaven or in another life and you'll always know who these people are and yeah so there's a lot of people there like oh, what's the thing? i'm sorry for the tangent there that yeah they were just doing a lot of fundraising for the military and i met a lot of military men out there it it is a big healing ground for people who are getting out of the Marines and Army and Navy, all those branches. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad, you know, because that is such a positive way for these, um, you know, fellow veterans to go and do. Mm -hmm. It really is because it's a great way I w could see for people transitioning out of that lifestyle into civilian lifestyle yeah you transition yourself and your skills from who you were to this person on a trail yeah to and you get help out the communal trail, mm -hmm. the trail community yeah and it's also like you kind of get to learn a new self about yourself because you're mm. getting you know you're getting your trail name you're getting a new um identity and you know and when you're it seems like with the same with the military, you know, you kind of get a new identity when you join them, like when you join the Marines, you know, you started this kind of got this new alter ego of, you know, you're known as this big military person, you know, clean shaved and everything going to this like kind of hippie, mm -hmm. hippie vibe <laughs> where you're dirty and grungy and you're like a homeless person, but you were living in the mountains, living out of a backpack. And yeah, it's, I feel like that's a really great way for people to, yeah, people yeah, who need to transition. Honestly, anybody who needs to, any person who needs to transition out of anything in your life, that is a great place to go. It's like the best therapy and self discovering healing that anybody could do is just going on a walking pilgrimage across the United States or across Europe or across, you know, Mexico, wherever you want to go, whatever trail, whatever hike is calling you, it, there is something for you to do out there. 
Yeah, it's really romantic. And we've and well, we've been at two hours, seven minutes, so uh Yeah, we should probably where, wrap up. And Baba Joe was so good. He really was. He is. He's basically the star of the show. He is. He's so, a key pie. Um, so where can people find you? Yeah, so people can find me. Um I have an Instagram. Um, you can follow. I do a lot of art. I'm a uh, little part-time artist. Um, my Instagram is Soul Right S O L U R I G H T Creations at Instagram. I'd probably be like one of the better ones. Um, and yeah, that's for YouTube. And yeah, uh, in YouTube, also Soul Right Creations at YouTube as well. And yeah, it's just mostly like my art is all. Um, it's all landscape, um, human interactions, kind of. Uh, what's the style? It's like a Zen tangle. It's all yeah, Zen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my art is a meditational form of art. That's what I do. I know people all talk about it every time they come over for the podcast. They go into the bathroom and they see your art on the wall. And they're like, "Does that Mount St. Helens?" I'm like, yep. <laughs> You're like, my sister did that. I know. I've looked at that picture, yep. and I'm always like, "Man, I need to redo it" because I've like leveled up as an artist since then. Cool. I well, know. it's still a great frame, so if you want to redo it, I know I should redo. I should I'll just put make a frame. new one. Well, thank you for that. All right, guys, be sure to like, subscribe, and smash that bell for more data-driven updates. Mm -hmm. Leave comments below. Bye. Mm -hmm.